Dr. Stephen Long is the Kerry M. McGuire University Professor of Ethics at Southern Methodist University. Uh, he's no stranger to the Chicagoland area, having previously taught at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary in Evanston, and then for a number of years just up the road in Milwaukee with the Jesuits at Milwaukee, uh, Marquette University. His theological interests are wide-ranging, having published on Thomas Aquinas' Doctrine of Divine Simplicity, on the theological friendship and ecumenical encounter between Karl Barth and Hans Urs von Balthasar, a theological commentary on Hebrews, and on philosophy and theology of language, and that's only to name his book-length engagements. Dr. Long's uh, broad range of theological interests and expertise make him particularly well-suited to treat our next theologian, uh, Balthazar. And his lecture is entitled, From Mirror to Window, Hans Urs von Balthazar's Reflection on Theology, Modern Science, and Creation. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Steve Long. Thank you, Joel. It's good to be here among old friends, some who are getting older, and new friends. It's a delight to spend the day amongst theologians. How, how many times do you get to say that in your life? So that's great. The French Jesuit Henri de Lubac once referred to Hans Urs von Balthasar, who lived from 1905 to 1988, as, quote, the most learned man in Europe, end quote. Now, there was hardly a topic that did not interest him. In fact, he published on so many different topics that few scholars have the expertise to provide an informed overall review of his work. And I'm certainly not one of them. Nonetheless, I will. <laughs> it's never stopped me before, right? <clears throat> there is a consistent theme that runs throughout his work, and that's the relationship between Christianity modernity, and secularity. His earliest three-volume work, Apocalypse of the German Soul, analyzed relationships between these themes, drawing primarily on philosophers and the single theologian who appeared in it, one who later became his friend, Karl Barth. Although he had an overarching concern about Christianity and, and modernity, Balthazar was not preoccupied with the relationship between Christianity and science. Nonetheless, even on this topic, he wrote a small book, at least small for him, you know, only 200 pages, which, direct, which directly addressed this. It was a 1958 publication translated into English called Science, Religion, and Christianity. It compiles two lectures that he gave as he traveled throughout Germany in 1950 and 19, through 1956. In 1950, Balthazar, who'd been trained by the Jesuits and took early vows, decided not to take final vows, and he left the Jesuits. He had been in a fight with the local bishop in Basel, and as long as he was with the Jesuits, he had protection. But the minute he left the Jesuits, he had no protection. The, some of the patrician families didn't like the fact that Balthazar had convinced their children to take vows of celibacy. And so, it's a long story, I mean, I, it, it's a fascinating story. He was banned from the city of Basel by the local bishop. And no bishop would incarnate him, so he had an irregular relationship with the church. So he began to survive, he began to travel throughout Germany and lecture in various churches and figure out what was going on. And some of the lectures that he did was on just the question of modernity and science. And this book is a compilation of those lectures. His note at the beginning of the book stated, this was, this was after it was published, the, uh, uh, before, uh, in a second edition, stated that he wanted to dedicate it, quote, to those who had been tortured, gassed, vivisected to those deported and frozen to death in open cattle trucks, to those kicked in the face by Nazi jackboots, to those deliberately forgotten ones who have given all in vain, end quote. Now, it's unclear why he tells us that he wanted to dedicate the book to these people, but he didn't dedicate the book to them. It's odd. Uh, 
His lectures suggest that it's an indictment, that the reason for this dedication is an indictment of science when it is put to nefarious ends. The horrible uses to which it had been put in the decades before his lecture, he goes on to suggest, called much of science, not all of it, but called science into question, much as Christianity's own complicity in some of these events had called it into question. Science, he goes on to argue, needs an adequate philosophy that makes a place for theology, especially Trinitarian theology, to resist the Promethean temptation of self-mastery. Now, there was no in-depth analysis of specific sciences or scientists that appear in his work. But like most of his other works, Balthazar brought together ancient, medieval, and modern authors to evaluate philosophical and theological shifts brought on in the modern era. Balthazar never allowed for a single author to do, do his work, and there was a good reason for this. He said that the truth is symphonic. Truth is symphonic, so it needs this, this panoply of voices. Now, in what follows, I will first address the unique questions that Balthazar thought modernity posed to theology. Those questions set the context for much of his later work, especially his explicit attention to Christianity and science in the 1950s. Balthazar argued that philosophy, more so than scripture, was necessary to integrate science and theology. Yet Balthazar also argued that neither Protestant theology nor the dominant form of Catholic theology were well equipped to respond adequately to address these modern questions because of their sharp division between nature and grace. He thought that uh, the, the Catholic tradition that he had been trained in, the Jesuit tradition, the neo-scholastic uh, emphasis on Aristotelianism that focused on a doctrine of pure nature it was ill-equipped. And this caused him all kinds of trouble for challenging the doctrine of pure nature. And he also thought that Protestantism had uh, an insufficient philosophy and was too tempted to fideism. So he thought this was the wound of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, that, uh, that we had lost the integration of philosophy and theology, faith and reason, grace and nature. That's a scintillating part of my essay that I know you would have enjoyed, but I'm going to skip over that. So I'm only doing the first, second, and fourth point. First, engaging the modern, the Promethean and Dionysian. Now, Balthazar's relationship to the modern era is complex. He could speak of it positively. He could speak of it critically. He didn't, have a, he didn't have a narrative of decline, nor did he have a narrative of progress, but he could identify both. His programmatic 1952 work, Raising the Bastions, identified the modern era as presenting a new view of a unified humanity with common aspirations that resonated well with Christian love and hope. Science contributed to this unity. He wrote this, quote, but the world that lies in the pangs of birth is a humanity becoming aware for the first time of its unity on this planet and of the duty of stewarding itself. And it pursues these goals with a hitherto unknown spiritual exertion, end quote. Several themes in that statement are important. First, a new humanism characterizes the modern era that brings to the fore an aspiration for unity. Second, this unity is pursued through an imminent secular activity, quote, the duty of humanity stewarding itself. Third, although this is a secular activity, striving for this unity takes the form of a unknown spiritual exertion. Now, Balthazar does not reject this modern secular striving. There is much in it, he argues, to affirm, but nor does he affirm it without qualification. 
Science, Christianity, and Religion, published six years after Raising the Bastions, continues to address these themes and to show the pro and con take on the modern secular developments that he identified. Secularization, he stated, is not simply to be rejected. It has, quote, a definitely positive aspect. It means that the Christian way of thought, this desire for uh, a unified humanity, the Christian way of thought is accepted outside the sphere of the church, end quote. The Christian way of thought now found outside the church is, quote, that men should love each other even to sacrificing their life to affirming an ultimate solidarity in their final destiny. So he was not opposed to this, this new humanism. He affirmed this modern sensibility, and it rightly took on the task of, quote, shaping the world, shaping the world. That's going to be an important theme that I'm going to revisit. Giving shape to humanity and the rest of creation is part of God's providential ordering. It was given to us before the fall, and it remains ours afterwards. Science can assist us in this vocation, yet... This, quote, fearful responsibility. Shaping the world is also a, a fearful responsibility. It can go horribly awry, as it had. It does so, Balthazar argues, when it not only misunderstands God, but even more importantly, when it misunderstands what it means to be human. The greatest danger of our time, he said, quote, is that large sections of mankind are guided by false and outdated concepts of man, end quote. And these false and outdated concepts are both theological and philosophical. The outdated theological concepts, he thought, were found in the Catholic doctrine of pure nature, which he railed against throughout his life, and a fideism that he thought was present in Protestantism that meant it didn't have an adequate philosophy. The philosophical outdated concepts are found in the twin temptations of what he identified as the Promethean and the Dionysian. The modern epoch tended either to empty God into humanity and thereby do away with God, or to raise humanity into God and thereby do away with human na nature. In the Apocalypse of the German Soul, Balthazar referred to the first as the Promethean and the second as the Dionysian. Now, one consequence of these philosophical temptations is that theology has been unable to adequately respond to this proper desire to unify humanity, a proper desire that doesn't yet know its true end. The work of philosophy had been overtaken by science. And science, he says, now attributes to secondary causes more and more of what used to be God's free agency as the first cause. Although Balthazar critiques this reduction, Christian responses, he thought, had been inadequate. Too often they appeal to the, quote, God of the gaps, end quote. Theology and philosophy allow science to explain everything it can on its own terms, not only about the physical world, of course, but also about economics, about politics, about culture, about the human being. When creaturely secondary causes cannot explain something, then the theologian fills in the gaps by appealing to God's miraculous intervention. But this, he said, is a useless strategy that parcels out agencies through an inappropriate division of intellectual labor. He wrote, quote, we do not add to the greatness of the creator if the prime mover is called in wherever we notice a gap in the secondary causes." End quote. Nor did he argue that scientific explanations should be challenged by direct appeals to scripture. He stated, quote, "...today we see clearly that we cannot fight science with scripture, because the aim of God's revelation in the Bible is not to teach men science." but how dearly had this understanding to be paid for. Perhaps something similar is happening now with the temporary difficulties of the modern science of the world. Surely, surely Christians should help to solve and integrate them 
instead of constantly finding occasion to postulate an immediate intervention of the creator who they think shows himself in this way, end quote. So some theologians initially reacted against science using the Bible as an alternative textbook that could explain everything science explained or fill in the gaps. The results, he thought, of these apologetic strategies were disastrous, calling Christianity into question and leaving people more open to the secular. It was a reason many found conflict between Christianity and science and sided with the latter. A preferable method Balthazar suggests, is that we should learn from Thomas Aquinas' modest response to the science of his day. He faced a similar issue. Aristotle had compelling arguments for the eternity of the world. Aquinas did not use scripture to counter Aristotle's arguments in order to reject his reason, to call them foolish or unwise. Reason may very well suggest that the world is eternal. And even though faith suggests otherwise, this does not provide dispositive evidence that Aristotle was wrong. Both may be reasonable positions. How do we adjudicate between them? For Balthazar, such adjudication is the role of philosophy. Because what brings together the way the world appears and all the ways that it can be considered is that it always, quote, appears under the aspect of being and needs interpretation by reason, which thus proves to be a, a function which not only passively reproduces, but actively considers and judges, the agent intellect. A special science is therefore needed to watch, examine, and justify this activity, and this is philosophy." End quote. The intellect Balthazar argues, drawing upon Thomas Aquinas, is not merely a passive mirror of nature, taking the world in and representing it. The intellect is an active agent that gives shape and form to the world. And it is this philosophical idea, more so than scripture, that he finds useful to bring science, religion, and Christianity into an integral whole. So let me conclude this first part by restating the unique questions Balthazar thought were raised by science in the modern era. The first one was, how shall we live together as one on a planet we all share? The second is, how might science contribute to that unity rather than destroying it? And the third is, what we desperately need is an account of what it needs to be human. So the second part of my presentation is to respond to those questions by drawing upon his lectures on science, religion, and Christianity. This work consists of two lectures. The first is science and religion, and the second is religion and Christianity. The first focuses on religion rather than Christianity because science, Balthazar argues, is concerned with religion rather than Christianity. Both are natural, science and religion are natural, rather than historical disciplines. Science, he suggests, is, quote, the activity of homo sapiens, who thus becomes also homo faber. The human person is the, the maker, the worker. Because he masters life's and life and things in the ways he has previously apprehended them. Science is human action on nature. Now these distinctions are important to make sense of the unlikely source Balthazar draws upon in his first lecture, Science and Religion. He positively interprets August Comte, who lived from 1798 to 1857, as it has been called the first philosopher of science. Comte affirmed nearly everything Balthazar opposed. A philosophy of positivism, in which religion is first transformed into philosophy or metaphysics, and then philosophy or metaphysics is transformed into science, positivism, and Comte reads this as a positive, progressive development. See what I did there with positive? <laughs> I just caught that. See if you're awake. It's a positive development of positivism. 
No. Now, <clears throat> Balthazar does not make it explicit, but his lectures reverse Comte's law of, devel of development. Rather than moving from, re uh, from religion to philosophy to science, Balthazar's lectures begin with science and its problems, move to philosophy, and then to religion, but they culminate in the historical revelation of Christianity. Comte's work is important, he thinks, because it shook the foundations of religion, raising the bastions. This shaking of the foundations is this transition from religion to philosophy and philosophy to science, which, which Balthazar says was, quote, rightly seen by Comte. In other words, Comte has accurately described where we are. And because he's accurately described where we are, we can no longer just continue doing things the way they had been done. Drawing on Comte's three stages in humanity's progressive development from theology to metaphysics to positivism, Balthazar then traces historical progress. He, he wants to read this positively. From an earlier epoch in which humanity conceived itself as, quote, being spirit within nature, end quote, to a modern scientific approach that sets humanity against nature. In the first, humanity is a mirror of nature. That has its positive implications for Balthazar. But the difficulty is we keep looking out at the universe and seeing ourselves. In the second, we're no longer a mirror of nature. Nature becomes a window. Nature now has limitless possibilities to be shaped by us. Philosophy becomes anthropology rather than cosmology. And again, this has liabilities and this has advantages. The liability is a potential loss of transcendence that alone makes the human creature intelligible. The advantage is that the human creature is no longer tempted to turn itself or something in nature into its God. The disenchantment has a positive feature. Those kinds of religious foundations have been shaken. Human creatures no longer look at the cosmos, find themselves mirrored in it, and are tempted to see a God in the mirror. Scientific study of the human individual does not envelop humanity into a mirror of nature, but opens a window to limitless possibilities for uniting humanity. But these same possibilities also raise the prospect of destroying it, especially through the new Promethean technological means that are produced. To avoid the latter, what science needs, suggests Balthazar, is an integrally human absorption of science into philosophy and philosophy into theology, one that works against a strong distinction between nature and supernature and resists the reduction of creation to utility by interpreting it through the transcendentals of truth, goodness, and beauty. See how he reverses Comte's law of development, working, work, working backwards without sacrificing what he thought was its gains. For Balthazar, there are two sources to proceed with the, the necessary human, uh, unity of humanity that lies before us. One comes from religion and science, and it's the natural development of consciousness. A second is from Christianity based on historical revelation. And during this period of his work, Balthazar seems to think that the latter, the historical revelation, can incorporate the former, the natural development of consciousness, into it. He summarizes his first lecture in a, a final paragraph that concisely sets out the relationship between science, religion, philosophy, and Christianity. He states, quote, it's a long quotation, but it's important. I'll, I'll unpack it. Because man as such is the locus of being in the world, he is unlimited and open towards being. Thus, he cannot be fully made into an object. It is possible to investigate all the aspects of man that are subjects of individual sciences. Yet this can be done with the right a priori and promise some success only if one refrains at the same time from interpreting man according to a consistent idea, however sublime. I love that. Just, just don't have consistency in your science and things will be okay. For man is the image of God, 
of whom it is absolutely certain that he cannot be defined by any finite formula. If you understand him, he is not God. This much philosophy should be able to state. But the unknown God comes alive for man by revealing himself. And so the unknown creature also uh, and, and so the unknown creature also becomes important and fascinating in his incomprehensibility. His features, are come, his features come to life, are lit up and deepened, which man beholds not in his mirror, but in his original. Only in the triune unity of God does man's unity appear and find itself as he turns from the old Adam to the new. Now, this dense paragraph requires some unpacking. I'm going to highlight four points. First, being is the primary category that philosophy works with, and science is subsumed within this category. Second, science works on nature by human beings identifying and describing what is. There would be no such work if there were no humans. No other creaturely being practices science. And for this reason, humanity is the locus of being in the world. Third, if the human creature were merely one being among other beings turned into an object, how could we account for the fact that he or she alone is capable of science? For Balthazar, this very possibility is a reason that the human creature is more than, not, not not apart from, but more than a being, more than an object of study to be classified. She is also open to being with a capital B. He uses small b being and, and capital B being. Fourth, notice that Balthazar distinguishes between being and capital B being, which is known in philosophy as the real distinction. This is very important for his work, the real distinction. And the influence of Aquinas and Heidegger is obvious here. He quotes them, and he also sounds warnings that anthropology, what it means to be human, cannot and should not be reduced to the merely rational, the merely technical, to beings at the expense of being. In the study of science, then, humanity studies itself in nature. This study should be pursued and has contributed to our knowledge of what it means to be human. Science asks the question, what is the human? The question must be asked, but it cannot be answered with a finite formula that seeks to be exhaustive. When or if it does, then it contributes not to the unity of humanity, but to its reduction, which inevitably leads to its destruction. Vivisection becomes the way we understand the living human being. And that, of course, is what has to be avoided. Now notice what Balthazar has done here. He has applied Augustine's teaching on the doctrine of God to anthropology. Augustine taught that if you imagine you have comprehended the subject matter of theology, then it is not God that you have comprehended, but something else which for those of us who have a master of divinity, I just always find the irony, you know, <laughs> master of divinity. What did you do? Oh, I mastered divinity. <laughs> if you comprehend it, it is not God. It's like the unmastering of divinity, maybe. I don't know. But Balthazar pushes this fundamental theological axiom one step further. Humanity is created in the image of God. So to have a true image of human nature we will also have to acknowledge that if you comprehend it, it is not understood. Human nature will never be exhaustively known through science or philosophy. The other should always be a mystery to you. Those of us who are married know this, or have children, right, or friends, or communicate with other people. This is a good thing. The other is a mystery. It should be. They're made in the image of God. Fathomless mystery. Philosophy... Um, can acknowledge this much about God. God is beyond comprehension. It can get there, and that's a good place to get. And Bal but, but that's not enough. And that's why, of course, he's going to argue you need 
Revelation as well. Now, Balthazar's Jesuit training reveals itself here. God is the magis, the more that always exceeds our grasp. Because God is the more and humanity is created in the image of God, who the human person is cannot be known solely from self-reflection. Made in the image of God, the human person has a creative, generative power. Her intelligence is not merely passive, receiving external stimuli, but also active, casting light upon the world that allows it to be made. So even the things in the world cannot be completely exhausted. No matter, I grew up in rural Indiana. My father was a high school basketball coach. I had two images on my wall growing up. One of Oscar Robertson, the greatest basketball player ever lived. No, it wasn't Michael Jordan. And the other of the, the, the periodic table of the elements. Those were the two things I grew up with. And, um, you know, and, and um, I mean, I loved science. And my, my parents taught me that religion and science were not contradictory. But, but, but that chart, you know, that chart can be very misleading. Like if we just have the right taxonomy, whether it's, whether it's uh, you know, Myers-Briggs, you know, I mean, I have that many personalities on a good day. I mean, if we just have the right taxonomy, <laughs> we'll understand the human person. Well, that's what he said. That's what, you, that's what needs to be avoided. That's what needs to be. They're helpful. They can be helpful. But don't think you've understood what it means to be human. Balthazar, and, 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 and also don't think you understand the objects in the world. Because they can always be other. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when we had to use a telephone that had a cord. And, you had to, and, and three other people were on the line. I had no idea at that time what, what we might be able to create. It's amazing what we've been able to produce. So the true for Balthazar is the maid. And here is where he can agree with a key element of modern science. The true is the maid. He agrees with, in part, he agrees with Cusa, with Vico, with William James. We know what is true, not only by contemplating it, as important as that is, he's not going to dismiss that, but we also know what's true by making it. This modern account of truth fits well with Thomas Aquinas's agent intellect because it shows not only what is, but also what can be by casting its light upon the world. Science works similarly. It is the activity of homo faber. The human being is the one who makes. But if this is all that can be said of its activity, several difficulties arise. One is that we can fall prey to what he called, quote, the technical craze. This is written in, and this is in the 1950s. Be careful of falling prey to the technical craze, imagining that our products will accomplish more than they do. Technical reason becomes the means by which we render politics, economics, even the church's mission intelligible. And Balthazar excoriates, quote, a few naive churchmen who are enraptured by wireless television and other aids to propaganda, end quote. Another difficulty is ensuring that our products serve us rather than we serve them. Balthazar states, quote, we have to find a mode of living with the monsters so that man can control them and enforce his superiority to the robots, though it is certain to be an exacting task. 1950s, he had no idea about a sex bot. You know, which my grandchildren and many of your children will have to confront. Related to this is a third problem. If you don't, if you don't know what that means, don't, don't Google sex bot, okay? Just don't do that. You don't want to know. Just, <laughs> we have somebody working on it in theology. It's, uh, we'll get it taken care of. <laughs> Related, related to this is the acceleration of the pace of modern life. It's, quote, external rush and ever-increasing speed. And that external rush and ever-increasing speed works against, quote, the interior culture demanding a world of silence. Do you remember silence? Like when you could go to the airport and there was silence and... You didn't think everybody was talking at you because they're looking right at you and talking. I don't know if you've had that experience at the airport. But he, he thought we were losing the world of silence in the 1950s. So, he argues, prayer and contemplation will be necessary, and silence, practices of silence, will be necessary to reinstate a proper account of what it means to be human. 
and that might be one of the most important things he suggests we can contribute to the relationship between theology and science. A fourth is that our products can begin to mirror ourselves rather than opening us to something other. Once again, rather than being a window, they become a mirror. Concrete and glass, quote, do not speak of God. They only point to man who is himself glorified in them, end quote. Balthazar saw the connection between these, di these difficulties raised by modern science and the economic structures that undergirded them. They reduce everything to a commodity that could be placed on a continuum, given a value, and exchanged with everything else. When the true is only the maid, the true is the maid, but when the true is only the maid, the market determines reality. Truth, goodness, and beauty are vanquished by utility and efficiency. Now these difficulties, he says, can prompt one to despair. But then Balthazar stated, I love this line, it should not be objected that in the modern world and its economic situation, there simply is no choice but to howl with the wolves. I like that. Theology should be more than just howling with the wolves at the situation that we're in. Since I'm tempted to howl with the wolves, I, that's very helpful. So what do we do? What do we do rather than just howl with the wolves? Well, for Balthazar, the way forward is this question that theology and science share. And, and, and here, we don't tell scientists how to practice physics or chemists how to do Grignard reactions. What we share is this question, what does it mean to be human? For Balthazar, it means to be the suspended middle. It's a line he gets from Henri de Lubac, his good friend and fellow Jesuit, who also challenged the doctrine of pure nature. The suspended middle is the human person as both an object within, a creature among other creatures, dolphins and, and chimpanzees and, you know, subject to, to space and, and, and time and everything that comes with it, and also a subject that transcends creaturely objects, who is capable of science, of forming, of creating. Um, and for Balthazar, it's... It is this aspect of what it means to be human that leads him to the importance of the doctrine of the Trinity. Balthazar argues in, later in his work, uh, and it, just as he argued here, that the doctrine of the Trinity is the precondition for the possibility of understanding what it means to be human and to do science. An outrageous claim, but especially for the doctrine of creation. He says, if there is no trinity, there is no creation. Trinity is necessary for creation because creation itself is unnecessary. God does not create, create out of any need. Creation does not satisfy something intrinsic to the divine nature. God has no lack. What explains the doctrine of creation, then, is not creation itself. It really has no purpose. It's like most of the animals we, that we don't eat every day, you know. They're just kind of there to be enjoyed. Um, it's, the doc, it's the character of God that explains the doctrine of creation because God is, as triune, both absolute being and at the same time a happening. That's his language. God is absolute being and at the same time a happening. The happening is the eternal processions, the coming to be of the Son from the Father and the Spirit from the Father and the Son. In God, Balthazar states, what would otherwise appear to be contradictory, God is a happening. God is an event. God is motion from the Father to the Son, from the Father and the Son to the Spirit. All of the things which God is absolute being can't be. God is in God's self both of these things, and we discover from the doctrine of revelation, that God can be this without contradiction. Now, this is important to understand creation because all earthly becoming is a reflection of the eternal happening in God. God is... Oops, I missed a page. Well, that's providential. <laughs> I, I got a minute left. So, so what Balthazar argues is that 
Uh, a philosophy of being, a philosophy of being will, will hold both of these poles together. That we as a people, and maybe this is something like first creation, we are the essence of humanity, right? If I, I mean, I never am confused by whether something's a salamander or a human. That's a very good thing. I'm not even confused about squirrels, and, and I like squirrels on the whole. But when I see a squirrel, I mean, I'm a, I'm a cyclist, and I accidentally ran over a squirrel the other day. I mean, I felt bad about that. I really did. And, and it died. And, um, <laughs> you know, and I felt bad. But, but it, if it was a human being, I would have felt different. I'll be real honest. I'll be, I don't know if you're a, a deep ecologist, but I probably don't agree with you. I, if it was a human being, I would have felt different. Why? Because we share in this unified essence of humanity, and it's important that we do. And yet, at the same time, if I said to you, I'm the essence of humanity, you'd say, yeah, you're really not. In fact, humanity will exist after you're gone. It existed before you were here. It existed after you were gone. So I'm a particular existence, a happening, within the genus called humanity. And for Balthazar, this is a reflection of the doctrine of the Trinity itself, where you have to learn to affirm both, both at the same time. Not to see yourself, your people, your nation as the essence of humanity. And at the same time to recognize you share that with others. And you have to make a space for them in the world. He thinks science can help us in this. So let me conclude these reflections on Balthazar's doctrine of creation by noting three implications. First, for Balthazar, the most appropriate metaphor for creation is music. Analogous to Augustine's De Musica, Creation is God's grand symphony played as a simultaneously perfect whole by an eternal conductor and experienced by creatures in finite temporal extension. So we're all just notes in the harmony who come into existence and go out of existence. But, but, the, but the harmony itself, the harmony itself is sustained. Without a, a creation as a grand symphony is a finite and temporal imitation of the infinite and eternal triune processions. God is in God's own self, a grand symphony, if you will. Without the Trinity, Balthazar states, there is no doctrine of creation. If creation is reduced to the finite and the technical, then it becomes something more like pure nature. This reduction is present in modern economics and the science that undergirds them. Marx once allegedly state that the capitalist walks through the beauty of forests, seeing the beauty around him asks, I wonder how many matchsticks I could get out of these trees. Now, Balthazar was not a Marxist, but he would understand the sentiment. But here's a central question that the modern raises for Balthazar. Will science reduce creation to quantification? Will it, quote, his language, mechanize even the natural roots of personal life, end quote? Will we finally have an algorithm for everything? If it does, then it flattens out the symphony into a single note. Creation is not a single note played repeatedly. It is a symphony. It is symphonic. It needs truth, goodness, and beauty to express it well. And his overriding fear was that we had lost the necessity of interpreting creation in the context of these transcendentals of beauty. Now I'm going to skip to my last two points. The second point is that for Balthazar, the best way to think about the relationship between theology and science is through Mary, the Marian vocation to make the truth. Because don't forget, Mary is Theotokos, the God-bearer. She gives birth to God. That's what we teach. I love that. It's so outlandish. Oh, who's Mary? Oh, yeah, she's the one who gives birth to God. I mean, and, and, in so, I mean, and this is what he means by saying that the theology is the maid, or the true is the maid. It's not the same thing as William James, because Mary obviously doesn't make God when you explain your Theotokos to your, the three-year-old, which I hope you're all doing. You know, you have to explain, yes, Mary gives birth to God, but God also exists outside of Mary. You know, God, God makes Mary possible, and then Mary gets to give birth to God. And then she gives birth to God's son. <laughs> okay. You know, but this is part of what it means to be, be involved in the, the truthfulness of God. God gives God's self over in, his, in God's holy humility, as, as Dr. Sonderegger has put it so beautifully in explaining God's power. 
to be birthed, to be killed, to be carried, to be buried, to be raised. And our task is like Mary's, to give birth to the truth, to make new things possible, but things that also at the same time participate in the life of God. Um, and, that's, uh, each, and that's the third point. For Balthazar, each of us is given a, a vocation, a mission, to make the truth of God present in the world. There is an idea that God has in creation as the eternal conductor, an idea how each of us are supposed to play the note that's given to us. And when we find that note, we'll find peace, rest, joy. And our task, and the task of science, is to find the right note. What's then the relationship between science and Christianity? Science doesn't need to be explicitly Christian. Courses in astrophysics shouldn't begin with Genesis 1. That way lies disaster. What matters is not that night neurobiologists, engineers, chemists, or for that matter, matter, plumbers, roofers, and bus drivers are baptized or explicitly affirm the Nicene Creed. What matters is they practice their craft well, and they practice it with an openness to the truth that does not reduce what they do to a finite formula, but that they're open to let their note become in harmony with other notes of truth, goodness, and beauty. It will be the task of the church to receive these diverse missionary offerings, some Christian, some not Christian, to bring them into the presence of God as living sacrifices that unite the incommunicable uniqueness of each person with the intended aesthetic harmony God intends, in which God and creation dwell together. So let me give Balthazar the last word. Quote, the cosmos becomes sacred through the holiness of the church, and the church has not so much to make propaganda in the world, but above all, to pray and to remain in charity. End quote. Thank you. All right, well, thanks to God's providential ordering of our time together, we do have about 10 minutes left for questions. So if you have a question, uh, I'd like you to raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you. Uh, Kevin Hector, up in the front. Uh, yeah, just a second. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you for that paper. It was clear and engaging, and I appreciate it. Um, one of the claims in there, it, you don't tell us how you stand with respect to it, but for von Balthasar, um, that the doctrine of the Trinity is somehow necessary to resist or avoid certain ways that science and technology can be put to nefarious ends, right? And I was surprised by two things. One, that the doctrine of the Trinity is necessary to that. And two, that the doctrine of the Trinity is necessary to that, right? So with respect to the doctrine, I was surprised especially from you that the emphasis was on this doctrinal, seemingly intellectual kind of um, Doctrine yeah. as what's the antidote right, for right. what ails us. On the other hand, the fa the idea that um, that that's necessary, such that uh, not just not that it's sufficient, but that it's necessary, right, right. surprised me because it struck me that that obviously would entail that there's no other way of avoiding some of these things, and that struck me as maybe empirically Triumphal, implausible, so. implausible, and hard to warrant in any case. So I'd be interested yeah, to hear more about yeah. what you thought about that. I don't know why Balthazar said those kinds of things. No, no. <laughs> Darn him. Um, thanks, Kevin. I mean, yeah, I, I would concede the doctrine, the first part, the doctrine. It, it's, it's the life of the Trinity, um, which is, you know, set forth in the doctrine. Um, I, think, I think doctrine matters, as, as do you. Um, but it's obviously the life of the Trinity. The second actually comes from Thomas Aquinas. After Thomas, Thomas I think it's in question 32 of the Primipars of the Summa, Thomas says, why do we need the doctrine of the Trinity? It helps us render intelligible two things, what it means to be creature and what it means to be redeemed. So that's Thomas. And any, any explicitly, I, I, there was several pages I didn't read. If I could get to them, he quotes Thomas um, I'm saying that um, uh, when, when he says the doctrine of the Trinity is the precondition for creation, that's straight out of Thomas Aquinas. Thomas talks about a flux, a flumina, a flow that God and God's self is this flow, the Son from the Father, the Father and the Son, 
and the, the spirit from the Father and the Son. Thomas is a big defender of the filioque. Um, and then he argues the reason that that's necessary to render creation intelligible is precisely because it renders creation non-necessary. In other words, God already is in God's self, if, if you will, gift and reception. So it's not like creation gives something to God. Creation has no necessity in and of itself. So I, I don't think he's saying that that renders... I mean, there's other ways to think about the stuff around us. Materialism, naturalism, there's other ways to think about it. But if you want to understand what it means to be creation, then he, then he would say the only way to understand that, and it would get to this, this, this uh, absolute being and happening, he thinks the only way to do this is the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, I suppose you might push him on sort of, well, you know, Jews have a doctrine of, of creation. Uh, Muslims have a doctrine of creation. Other, other religions have a doctrine of creation. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what you... How, how would you respond to that? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean... And it's a good question. It strikes me that um, the claim that it's a plausible condition of rendering creation intelligible as such, um, that strikes me as a much... Yeah. A claim that you're more entitled to yeah. than the claim that it's necessary. But I get it. Yeah. Austin. Thank you, Dr. Long. Uh, I'm going to go back to the idea of the, the human being, the Imago Dei, as necessarily incomprehensible. So other people have done work in apophatic anthropology. Um, Catherine Tanner on a kind of more moderate side, Thomas Carlson on a, like a way different side. Um, I wonder if von Balthasar would say that even though the human being is incomprehensible, it still necessarily has a concrete content, or if he'd kind of go more in the Carlson direction and say that human beings make themselves to a certain extent. Um, so does it have a necessarily bounded content which is just ineffable, or is it something else? Uh, it's, uh, now, I mean, let me try to, I'm, I'm channeling Balthazar here. Adrian, no, no. Um, um, I think he would say, what he does say, which is controversial, is that you are not a person, you become a person. And a lot of people misunderstand that because it just seems wrong, right? Because we like the dignity of the person, and Balthazar comes along and says, no, you're not a person, your task is to become a person. And that would seem to suggest a kind of, un you, could, you could take that in a, an unbounded sort of way. But I don't think what, that's what he means. I think what he means something there is he's using the person and not analogically with the second person of the Trinity. Your, your task is to be made into the person that you are to come to be. But that's going to require some concreteness, a particular time, a particular space, a family, a history, and all of those things, and what you do with them. So, and that's also why, I mean, he's never going to, you know, you should study psychology. You should study all these, these sciences, sociology, and do what you can with them, um, as long as they have that kind of openness to being and don't create a, a finite, exhaustive formula. I think that's his primary concern. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but uh, it's a good question. Yeah. Dr. Long, thank you for, uh, for a great lecture. Um, so you had mentioned um, when... Balthazar is, is appealing to the intellect, he's indebted to Aquinas, this notion that it's an active agent giving meaning. And I was curious, um, when Balthazar is trying to integrate, to unify these very complex disciplines and avoid that reductionism, if he appeals to Thomas's doctrine or notion of abstraction, wherein it's not abstraction by extricating something from human life and reducing its complexity, but it's rather embedding something in human life and understanding the, the many and multivaried ways that we interact with that thing. Yeah, I think, I think he does something just like that in the theologic when he's, when he's trying to account, of how, how, account for how language functions and how it relates to truth. Um, and um, I mean, I think there is, a, there is a speculative and abstract moment in his work, which I think is necessary, which functions much as the way you say, as the sort of via eminencia. You, you look around very attentively. I think it was Kevin who talked about the importance of attention today, was that? Yeah, I mean, I mean you have to be attentive. 
Um, uh, Balthazar's secretary, when I was at the archive, she told me, I don't know if this is true or if it's apocryphal, but uh, I hope it's true, that uh, he hated recorded music. And so when he went on a train ride, he would take a score with him, and he would just shut out the world, world and focus on that score until he could hear the music. So, you know, I mean, that, that, I, I could not do that. And my son's a musician, maybe he could do that, but I couldn't do that. Um, I'd only hear Bob Dylan. But, but there's, <laughs> there's an attentiveness, there's an attentiveness to the everyday, which the more you focus on it, the deeper it takes you into being itself. So it's, so it's not abstraction, as you, as you put it so well, Will, it's not abstraction by, you know, it sort of removing yourself, but by this real attentiveness. Uh, which, is why, which is why we should love chemists. I remember when I taught my first teaching job, it was St. Joe's, we had this, this biologist I just adored her. I have no idea if she was faithful or not, but every, every week she would get really excited and she, she'd use the listserv improperly, but I was okay with it because she would send out on the listserv, oh, make sure you see such and such sprouting up today over by the, the auditorium, you know, and then she'd give, you, she'd give you its Latin name and explain it to you, and she was just so excited about it. And I thought, you know, the university... We, we like people like that. You know, we, there's a place for them with that kind of attentiveness um, and, and idiosyncrasy. So, yeah, I, I, if, if that's what you're suggesting, then I think that's good. We have time for one more. <clears throat> Is nobody going to take on the philosophy thing? Yeah, all right. I no. thought somebody... Uh, Dr. Oh. Fubel or Rick? If you're both quick, we could be two. <laughs> I'll, I'll put my question very quickly. Thanks, Steve, very much indeed. Can you tell us a little bit more about the new, pneumatology of von Balthasar? Because we're not left to our own devices in these projects, are we? Yeah. Um, That's not a quick question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he had one. <laughs> <laughs> but it just, it just hits me that it's a really good question because I, I'm, I'm not, I, I think it's in volume five of Theodrama. Um, um, the, no, the, spirits, the spirit is at work. I mean, it's not right. I mean, Balthazar was a very, I mean, uh, uh, had a strong place for the, for the Holy Spirit as moving us towards that end. Uh, as part of that, I think, um, uh, that symphony, um, I think that... That's a good question. I wish I had a better answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I would just like to come back. Great paper. Thank you very much. To um, um, Kevin Hector's question. I think von Balthasar was right, wasn't he, when he said that the doctrine of the Trinity is necessary to make the contingency of the world plausible. If you phrase it in that way, it makes, I think, perfect sense. <coughs> because the contingency of the world could not be explained in terms of the necessary condi conditions of being the world. And since the world is a contingent ent entity, it's possible of every event in the world to say that it can be otherwise or that it can be not. There must be a way of explaining that. You can only explain that in terms of a free agent. What kind of free agency can that be if it fulfills a need in any form? And it's not really free, but it has a kind of inherent necessity. Therefore, it must be grounded in relations that are completely free in themselves and don't have any necessity. And yeah. these are the processions of the Trinity. So I think that statement, um, as curious as it sounds, the doctrine of the Trinity is necessary in order to make the contingency of the world plausible is one that theologians, Christian theologians, must hold in some sense. The alternatives to that are um, far more disastrous than this one. Right. All right. Will you join me in thanking Dr. Long? Thanks. 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 All right.